so thanks so much for coming to this week's uh, lect Diaz lecture, where we're hosting Matthew Kawana Galizia, who's the director of the Daphne Kawana Galizia Foundation. And um, I, so in May this year, we, we hosted Dr. Agnes Calamar, who's the, who was the Secretary General of Amnesty International. And she talked about Russia's war against Ukraine and its implications for the world. So we're following up on the topic of security and policy. And today, we are lucky enough to have uh, Matty with us, who will talk about journalistic freedom and safety. Matthew worked at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ, developing the technology that enabled major investigations, such as Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. ICIJ and its partners won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting in 2017. That same year, Matthew's mother, Daphne, was assassinated following her investigations into corruption in Malta. Matthew left the ICIJ to continue working on the case around the killing of his mother, and he has been the director of the Daphne Kawana Galitza Foundation since 2018. This year, the foundation was awarded the European Parliament Citizen Prize, which recognizes initiatives that contribute to European cooperation and the promotion of common values. The topic of journalistic freedom and security continues to be discussed at the highest levels within Europe and worldwide. The president of the European Parliament, sorry, I'll just bring up the slides here. So the president of the European Parliament, uh, Roberta Metzola, who is Maltese, uh, has been very visible on this issue. So we asked President Metzola for a statement on journalistic freedom in the European Union and on the work being done by the Daphne Caruana Galicia Foundation. I will read the President's statement in full. Press freedom is under pressure in Europe and across the world. I learned the horrors of this, perhaps more acutely than before, five years ago when Daphne Caruana Galizia was assassinated in broad daylight in Malta. After years of harassment and intimidation, attempting to pressure Daphne into self-censorship and her bravely not budging, the only way they could silence her was with a massive car bomb outside her family home. On that day, they killed a journalist, a woman, a mother, and robbed people of their right to the truth. Daphne was not the first journalist to be murdered. She would not be the last. Jan Kuciak and his fiance were murdered in Slovakia only a few months later. But Daphne's murder crossed the line for many in Europe and touched a nerve that perhaps had laid dormant since Veronica Guerin's assassination in 1996. Corruption kills not only journalists, but campaigners, activists, and politicians too. This is why we cannot look away. Of course, it is always easier to sit down than to stand up, and the perpetrators bank on that, but they are wrong. In Europe, we came together like never before, and here I want to thank Matthew Kawana Galizia and the Daphne Kawana Galizia Foundation for all their work in protecting and strengthening independent journalism within our union and beyond. I cannot think of a more deserving initiative than the work of the Daphne Kawana Galizia Foundation to be awarded the 2022 European Citizens Prize. For years, the European Parliament has had the protection of media freedom at the top of its agenda calling for new rules to protect journalists from being silenced. Currently, the European Parliament is working on the new Media Freedom Act, or the Daphne Law, as we like to call it, and is spearheading efforts for a new directive to limit the use of strategic lawsuits against public participation, a directive that I have made a personal priority. These upcoming laws will allow journalists to do their work without having to fear financial or emotional ruin or even worse, for their lives. Sessions like these are also crucial to raise awareness about the pressures that journalists face and to gather momentum to change it. Because at the end of the day, a strong democracy needs a strong press. And make no mistake, there can be no democracy without a free press. So with that, I'd like to welcome Matthew Kawana Galizia to the stage. It's all yours, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
On behalf of my family and the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation, I want to thank the Danish Institute for Advanced Studies and my friend of three decades, Carl Atad, for inviting me to speak here. It's an honor for me. Almost seven years ago, a tsunami of press reports hit the world, revealing secret networks of offshore companies set up for tax evasion, fraud, and money laundering. It was the Panama Papers expose. Based on one of the largest leaks in the history of journalism, 11.5 million documents, emails, contracts, deeds, retrieved from the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca and sent anonymously to investigative journalists at the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung. Unable to handle the huge mass of data, the newspaper had contacted the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, where I worked and that Carl mentioned. It's a small non-profit organization based in Washington, D.C., but with a global reach through its network of hundreds of investigative reporters all over the world. That was the beginning of what would be the largest ever global collaborative journalism project the world had ever seen and one which would reach into our lives in ways we could have never imagined. Carl and I grew up in Malta in the 90s in neighboring villages at a time the country when the country was not yet an EU member state. Travel outside our island was rare and expensive and there were few opportunities, but we had a lot of freedom. We explored every corner of the countryside that surrounded us. And I believe that sense of curiosity is what let, uh, led us down our inquisitive career paths. Fed up of working in tourism in Malta and encouraged by my mother, I became a software engineer by profession. As a student, you can probably tell that from the way I dress. As a, as a student, I dreamed of applying technology to the world of journalism. That thanks to my mother, I grew up in. She was a journalist for 30 years and the first woman journalist, the first female journalist in Malta. I got that chance with ICIJ, working with colleagues in Europe, the US and Latin America to turn the raw data that was handed to us by sources into something that could be searched and analyzed by journalists. When we started receiving one multi-terabyte disk with leaked files after another from sources, we realized that we were going to have to pioneer the technology we needed to properly investigate it. At the time, no tool existed for making millions of documents available to hundreds of people around the world in a secure and easy way that allowed them to search through every single one of those documents. We had to build it from scratch using bits and pieces of open source software, and we succeeded. When my colleagues and I made all our leaked documents available on the platform we had built, my feeling was that we were changing journalism forever and the world with it. I have no doubt that it was thanks to that work that the obscure and niche world of the financial, uh, financial system, offshore money laundering, shell company, are now commonly understood and that the decades long campaign for tax justice got the boost that it needed. As journalists around the world raked through the leaked Panama Papers documents that we made available, discovering underground rivers of dirty money flow flowing between tycoons, government officials, politicians, criminals. At our family home in Bidnia, a small village in Malta, my mother was unknowingly working on a related investigation. Imagine two people start digging tunnels, one starting in America and the other starting in Europe, each without being aware of the other. And somehow, by some incredible serendipity, they meet in the middle, under the Atlantic, in the mud and dirt of the offshore financial system. That's the feeling I had when I realized that the data provided to me in the Panama Papers contained explosive information on the same key politicians that my mother had been investigating in Malta. This raises the question that if we are depending on serendipity to uncover wrongdoing, then how much is going by unnoticed? 
I'm certain it's the majority and that luck and chance are not the most reliable tools for defending our democracies. That's something I'll come back to later. For years, my mother had questioned and investigated the networks of influence and interests that had propelled our former prime minister, Joseph Muscat, to power in 2013. She had long suspected that the people closest to him in his role as prime minister were implicated in illicit activity. That illicit activity we know today turned out to be a corrupt scheme surrounding the privatization of our power company. My mother's uncovering of that scheme and the role of the government of Azerbaijan in it led directly to her assassination. Leading up to that date, my mother had dealt with hundreds of incidents of harassment and violent attacks, even unrelated going long back to, to before that she was investigating what led to her murder. She had a restraining order against a politician who chased her down the street. Our house had been set on fire twice, once when I was nine years old and again when I was 20 years old. And she had been sued for defamation more than 50 times. My family inherited 46 of those defamation cases. I sometimes get asked what made my mother so threatening to Malta's political and business establishment. I think it's exactly what made her so loved and admired by everyone else. She was extremely intelligent and funny. In a country devoid of accountability, her ability to poke fun at people in the public eye and those who tried to hide from it was the only kind of justice that we could save her. She knew her subject matter. She was trustworthy, discreet and patient and sources came to her for those reasons. She educated her readers on an incredible number of subjects, especially about what their rights were and how they should stand up for themselves. Words and phrases that are now commonplace in Maltese public discourse, such as kickbacks and money laundering, were popularized in Maltese media by my mother. It's worth explaining this word here for those who don't know it, because we'll come to it later on. And it's a fundamental criminal mechanism that's at the heart of all major corruption worldwide. In corruption, it always takes two to tango. That's the, what I always like to say. Imagine you're a man, managing a newspaper business on behalf of its owners. You're the CEO or the managing director. Your friend runs a paper company and he's your business's only supplier, contracted to supply your, pay, your newspaper with the paper it's printed on. Without him, you cannot print that newspaper. You agree with him that he will increase the price of the paper he supplies, and you will justify that increase to the newspaper's owners. In return, he will secretly pay you some of his profits from the price increase. That's the kickback. You will then take some of your share and give it to an influential member of the newspaper's board of directors, who becomes your ally in the corruption scheme. This is a modus operandi, MO is the acronym we use, that has been used in Malta over and over again. What happened over the past 10 years that made our situation so dangerous is that this corruption occurred not opportunistically, or not only opportunistically, in the sense that kickbacks were requested when the opportunity came by chance, but strategically as an entire system for ruling the country. And this is what we call kleptocracy. Now, I'm a, I'm a terrible driver. I failed my driving test and now Carl is going to laugh no less than five times <laughs> before I finally passed and got my license. But there's one lesson my teacher taught me, and I forgot all the others, that really stuck with me. A vehicle is a weapon. Political parties and organizations are vehicles too, for good or for bad. Like cars, the point is to get you from point A to point B, which in the case of political parties would be the enactment of some new social policy. As political parties or vehicles, they can also be weapons. More than a decade ago, a group of people formed what we now think of as a criminal organization, 
around the then leader of Malta's opposition party, Joseph Muscat. That group flooded the party with money, allowing it to mount a campaign for election like any other we had seen before. Unlike any other we had seen before, sorry. They hired speechwriters from publicity agencies in the UK. They used micro-targeting instead of a unifying ideology, promising to legalize civil marriage to liberal groups, while promising to sink migrant boats to more conservative groups, promising to protect the environment to Greens, but promising to grant more rights to hunters and property developers, all things that are in conflict with each other. While interest groups were distracted by the promises of government made to them in isolation, no one except my mother was questioning the deals that were being struck with businesses and other governments. A decision to sell our power grid to China went by without any scrutiny or discussion, as did decisions to start selling Maltese passports, to privatize our public hospitals, and our company in a deal with Azerbaijan. By the time the majority of people realized it was all a sham, it was too late. As one senior European political figure put it to me, the socially liberal policies that were nothing more than the re recognition of basic human rights were a smokescreen for a much deeper, wider strategy of a small group of people to steal as many of the country's resources as they could. One factor that people like us have on our side against this kind of criminal organization that should function to always give us hope is that if such a small group of people can do so much damage, then another group of people, even if equally small, can hold them to account and drive the change that will undo the damage. But that is something that can only happen once the truth is revealed. That is why civil rights movements use the phrase truth and justice, because one follows the other. How did we expose the truth about my mother's assassination? In every story like this, there's an emperor has no clothes moment for the public. I think that moment when everyone realized what was being hidden from them and how depraved our establishment had, had become was when a business operator called Jürgen Fenech was arrested. I was in Dubai at the time. By that point in November 2019, I had left my full-time job and set up the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation in Malta with my brothers and father. We had a staff of two myself and my partner in the foundation, Martina Urso. It was very tough getting started. The Daphne Project, a collaboration of journalists set up to continue my mother's work, had published their main findings more than a year before, and they were powerful, but we were still hunting for the person who paid the hired assassins. I had traveled to the United Arab Emirates with a, journal a journalist from Reuters, Stephen Gray, who was part of the Daphne Project, and who later went on to produce an acclaimed podcast called Who Killed Daphne that was released a few months ago. <clears throat> we spoke to sources in Dubai, in the financial services sector there, and visited the obscure office where Fenech, who was arrested, had opened a secret company, 17 Black, that my mother had uncovered was to route payments to senior Maltese officials. His scheme was simple. He would get a stake in Malta's energy sector for Azerbaijan, get Malta on a contract to buy gas from that country for 30 years, and in return, he would kick back some of what they paid him to those officials responsible for energy policy decisions, all in secret, of course. I was feeling disappointed in Dubai, and like I had hit a brick wall when the people I spoke to there pretended the company never existed and escorted me out of the building where it was registered. When I knew for a fact that it had been registered there because I had bank documents to prove it and that it did exist, I thought if everyone was prepared to lie and cover up, how were we supposed to get anywhere? 12 hours later, my phone was ringing off the hook. Fenech had been arrested for the murder of my mother, 
while attempting to flee Malta before dawn on his luxury yacht. I flew back to Malta to see people protesting in the street, of course, with a rage that I had never seen before in Malta. Outside the parliament, people were throwing food, toilet paper and coins at ministers as they left parliament. Within a few weeks, our prime minister, Joseph Muscat, was forced to resign in disgrace. One might ask, why were Maltese people happy with the system for so long? Why do the same people and the same political party keep getting re-elected? Indeed, when we published the Panama Papers in 2016, I thought the Maltese government would collapse immediately. I was so naive. Instead, the Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, called an early election and was elected with an even stronger majority. He had a mandate for corruption. Another Prime Minister for the, from the same political party was elected in 2020. Well, for the record, Maltese people are not happy at all. A Gallup poll found that we are the angriest and most worried people in the European Union. 64% of those interviewed by Gallup said they were worried about something at some point in the day, they took, day before they took part in the survey. This rate was not only the highest in Europe, but also the fourth highest in the world. Half of the Maltese respondents also said they experienced stress the day before their interview. Just under 40% of those surveyed said they experienced some form of physical pain in the day before their interview. A separate survey found that 70% of young people want to leave the country for good. I cannot say for certain that the cause of this unhappiness is corruption or a lack of accountability. But I can say that where it exists, it is used like an artillery gun by a corrupt government, redirected to attack those like my mother who seek to hold the corrupt to account. To achieve that end, they will use one important tool, propaganda across every medium, including especially social media. I'll show you just how powerful the effect of propaganda can be when it is used to dehumanize a critic of the government or an entire class of critics such as journalists, scientists, activists or any other group within civil society. My family and I learned immediately after my mother's death that killing her was not only the first step towards making her disappear forever, the next steps were to kill her legacy, to turn people against her, and to harass and intimidate anyone who ever even dares to commemorate her, or to fight for justice for her assassination and for investigations into the crimes that she exposed. Our family, my mother's friends and colleagues in Malta and in the international media, have been compelled to accept that some people are happy that she was killed in such a horrific way. That is a direct outcome of a 30-year campaign to distort my mother's work, which has continued now that she is no longer around to defend it. Immediately after the murder, a police officer posted on Facebook that my mother got what she deserved. He was suspended but never fired. A governing party official said that he was happy that my mother was no longer around. Others posted photos of fireworks and attacked anyone calling for justice for the murder on the day of the assassination. There have been repeated attempts to encourage people to forget my mother in the hope that they will also forget her work and the corruption and crimes that she exposed and that they will also forget that the people who committed those crimes enjoy complete impunity and possibly protection by people in power. The day my mother died, a group of young people left flowers in her memory on a monument opposite the law courts in Valletta, our capital city. Those flowers grew into what we call a protest memorial, where until the lockdown, in 2020, people gathered every 16th of the month to commemorate my mother and to call for justice. 
at the last count, the protest memorial had been destroyed over 60 times by cleaners hired by the government. We now know that this happened on the instructions of the Minister of Justice himself. The state broadcaster never reported on the vigils held every month. The vigil organizers were mocked and heckled. Even I was mocked and heckled when standing at the site of the, of the murder of my mother. The, the activists were forced to file a case in Malta's constitutional courts to protect their right to protest. And they won, which was a triumph of hope over cynicism. A rare one, but still a triumph. People in power who influence law enforcement control a large part of Malta's media, including the state broadcaster, and who influence the thinking of many of my fellow Maltese who brand my mother as a traitor, as a witch, as a purveyor of fake news. They refer to her as a, as a hate blogger, a term that government officials were not embarrassed to use even in official communications with international organizations. They say, my mother expressed herself too harshly, that she wrote too freely, as though there is such a thing. Effectively, they blame her for her own assassination. This is why I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today. If the memory and legacy of anyone fighting for accountability are destroyed, the criminal and the corrupt will have triumphed and the universal values my mother worked so hard to defend will have failed. My mother herself is now beyond all harm, but at the foundation but at the foundation and with the support and help of our friends and supporters, we will honor and continue her life's work. In doing so, we help to protect her legacy. We want that legacy to remind everyone that watchdog journalism, that investigative journalism is essential to democracy and that true democracy does not exist if journalists are unable to work, work freely words that I am happy that the President of the European Parliament agrees with. This reminds us that our rights, including the right to know, should not be taken for granted. Right now, I feel like that my country is at a turning point. We can either go one way or another. Those who paid for and executed the murder are in custody pending trial, or have already been sentenced, mainly thanks to civil society, journalists, and a handful of excellent investigators and prosecutors. But full justice, especially for corruption, remains far off. In my generation, Malta has never prosecuted a single public officer for the crime of corruption. It's important that we maintain pressure and continue our push for accountability. For that, we need support. But so is the world at a turning point. Corruption in the energy sector or in the extractive industries in general is rampant which, with huge implications for society. As the world pushes for greener energy sources in the fight against climate change and, and, climate change and for environmental justice, the fossil fuel sector will become more aggressive in its lobbying efforts. Never has the need for investigative journalists like my mother for anyone working to expose corruption, been greater. Please support them however you can. But also never has the need for a reorganization of our approach to fighting and preventing crime and corruption been greater. While journalists are collaborating like no one else and becoming more and more effective at exposing the truth, they cannot themselves prosecute, judge, convict, or even fix systems, let alone design new ones. For that, we depend on people like you, working at the intersection of so many disciplines. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. That was a great talk. Questions? We do have quite a lot of time. Just to remind everyone, the session goes till uh, quarter past 12. Matthew will stay uh, around after that as well for a few minutes, just in case you want to have a chat uh, with him. Um, thank you very much.
Ryan? Okay, thank you very much for, for sharing this story. It must be very difficult. And of course, I'm so sorry for your, for your loss. Thank you. It's a tragedy for your family, but also for the world as such. So I, when, when you tell the, the specific story from Malta, I see lots of parallels to, to my home country, which is the United States in, in, in many ways. And, and I think that, that, that what really bothers me a lot is this, is this, this sort of... Um, I agree with you that the, the democracy needs a free press. There's no question about that. But the problem is, is that this idea of what a free press is is so convoluted in people's minds. Fake news. If, it, if, it, if it's something you don't agree with, it's fake news. Free press is actually, the United States is actually more or less equal to fake news in a large portion of the population there. How do you deal with that? I mean, they keep electing corrupt politicians in Malta, and I'm afraid that this could happen again in the United States. And, you know, it's not for a lack of information necessarily, but it's a matter of how people interface with the information that's available. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I, I think the job of holding, I mean, a press is free when there are various sort of elements to that freedom. That includes, I mean, editorial freedom, of course, financial freedom. The media organization itself never has to worry or, or doesn't have to worry all the time about how it's going to pay journalists, how it's going to sustain itself, and so on. Um, freedom from intimidation. You don't have to worry about being killed or harassed or threatened. Um, but of course, a journalist like everyone else do sometimes get stories wrong. And the, the risk of that happening is, is really high. I mean, you need to break news fa fast. That's, that's part of the sort of competitive element of journalism. People want to find out things quickly and want information from you quickly. But I think that the, um, the correction that should occur within journalism, where a story that is wrong um, needs to be corrected, should be left up to, the, to, to journalists themselves. In a properly functioning media system, you will have many competing media organizations. And they are not really enemies of each other, but they're competing with each other. So that if one publication gets a story wrong, another one is ready to correct it. This is why I think it's unnecessary for politicians to jump in and you know, attack journalists for fake news or anything like that. Fine, propaganda does exist. And there are some media organizations which are overtly propagandistic in the sense that they exist only um, to disinform on behalf of a government or a business or, or something like that. And that does need to be investigated and called out. But it can be done by journalists themselves. You don't need a politician to attack journalists in general. That I would, that I would say is, is harmful. I mean, it sets up journalists in general as a target. Just, just to follow up on of course. that, that's, that's a great answer. I appreciate that. And, 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 and the question I'm asking doesn't necessarily have a, have, have a real answer to it. But I think in many ways, I think that the journalists are speaking to a tone deaf public. And, 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 and at least a broad swath of it is tone deaf. And how do you do something about that? I mean, how do you get people to, to Fox News in the United States? That's one of the propaganda news, news agencies you're, you're, you're talking about, at least in my head. It is. I, my, my family loves it, <laughs> you know, so I have to be careful. I tread water sometimes when I'm at home. But, 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 but still, those, those aren't competitive news, new news platforms. Those are different platforms with different, different objectives, actually. Both of them, at least in parts of the public, are viewed as being accurate representations of the news, but they're not. And, and, and I don't know how you get the, the, the public to understand what fake news is and isn't. I mean, what, what governments can do um, that is constructive and doesn't interfere with the work of journalists themselves is to use the tools of market regulation. 
one of the problems that you have in the US, why you do have the best journalists in the world in the US, um, is that there is very little variety of output or very little competition between media organizations because so many of them are actually ultimately owned by the same small group of, of conglomerates or s same group of individuals. I mean, Fox is one organization, but it has thousands of media outlets all over the US that just basically repeat the same message from the same, from the same organization. Um, the, the role of the US government in that context to create or to foster sort of um, more independent media would be to ensure that there is better market regulation and that no single company can come to dominate a media sector. And of course, this applies for the telecommunications sector. For example, in the US, it is possible for European mobile operators like T-Mobile to do things that would not be acceptable in the European Union. For example, they can sell mobile phone packages that only give you access to Facebook or that only give you access to YouTube or that give you free access to Fox or that give you free access to CNN or whatever, um, violating you know, net neutrality rules and so on. Um, so I would say that governments need to use more regulatory tools to ensure that there is competition within the media sector. And of course that there is support for public sector, sorry, for state broadcasting as well, and that it is editorially independent, because that is a public good. We have another question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a very touching and important uh, uh, talk. I'm more pessimistic, I think, than you, um, in the sense that you seem to be looking at supply side, the policy regimes have to change, and of course that's part of the story, no doubt. But what I think is that the deeper heart of the problem that Don talks about is actually education, isn't it? It's the demand side issue. How do we, in today's world of, you know, capture by the tech big four through these dopamine hits that they uh, hook us on by design, how do we fight back and, 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 and try and uh, sort of um, create in the wider public, through education of some sort, uh, you know, a critical attitude, uh, a more you know, openness to, for example, understand the, the, the criteria for what is news, what is not? That's, of course, a very difficult question, but I wonder what your thoughts are. Um, it is, I mean, that's, that's an important question. And one of the things that I have really struggled with in Malta I mean, as a citizen of the country, is the void that was left by a figure like my mother, who apart from being a journalist was also a public intellectual. Now there is no one left who is occupying that role. And while of course you can legislate for access to education or um, a f funding for educational campaigns and so on that will reap fruit a generation down the line, let's say. And that is important. Um, there, there is a certain kind of education that can only be provided by people who have that role within a society of the public intellectual. Um, so in Italy, for example, you would have Roberto Saviano. I mean, in other countries, you would have similar people. I'm not sure who occupies that role in Denmark, but I'm certain that there are a couple of people. Um, so I see that role as being critically important. And very often, yes, those people come from within academia. Um, they use their position within academi academia um, to speak with credibility on a certain matter and educate the people on that matter. I mean, my family is now involved in a campaign um, to make it more difficult to, you, to abuse uh, defamation law to go after people who are expressing themselves in public. And what we are seeing is that this is increasingly being used against academics. Um, so in Belgium, for example, there is one particular case of a virologist, Mark Van Rant, who was speaking out ab about the, the pandemic and calling out people 
who were presenting themselves as specialists but spreading disinformation. And he was sued by some of these people, baselessly, obviously, but it was an attempt to, to harass someone who was playing that role of a public intellectual and providing a public service by, yes, as you say, educating people on what is disinformation, what isn't, what is factual, what isn't, what is scientific, what isn't, as a scientist. Um, and we have actually thrown quite a lot of effort into this campaign, because what we are seeing is that people who, who tend to play this kind of role, where they speak up publicly because they are in opposition to do so, um, are increasingly less willing to do that because they say, look, you know what, it's not worth it. Um, the lawsuit, the costs, the sort of negative public exposure, it just isn't worth it. This is why we are trying so hard to push back against that with legal tools. I mean, of course, sort of legislating to make filing abusive lawsuits against people who speak out more difficult is going to help. It's not, not the, um, it's not the only solution. Um, we need people, organizations, you know, to sort of stand up for each other. Even people you do not agree with, perhaps, um, who are being told to shut up. Um, as long as you're certain, you know, that they're speaking, they're expressing honest opinions. Okay, we have a, a couple other questions. We have one over here. Well, hello, Matthew. Thank you Hi. for your talk, and uh, thank you for your engaging uh, comments also to the, to the questions. Um, I think both uh, Don and Peter have in some ways um, um, enlarged on the interplay between, let's say, the media or the journalist, the world of journalism, and the outside world, companies, private affairs, politicians, and you have highlighted this this relationship yourself in your talk, and um, and I fully fully buy into the, the the threat that the outside can have to the world of investigative journalism. But I, I will come at this uh, as someone who's uh, quite disillusioned with the world of journalism, and I would like your comments on on um, you know what I see as. Um, an ecosystem in decay. Uh, so lowered standards of independence, lowered standards of inquiry, uh, lower, um, a lowered capacity to pursue investigation within journalism. And um, to give you a few examples, uh, so I'm looking inside, right? Um, uh, I, I often read the New York Times. And I read it online because I, I can't get the hard copy delivered fast enough for it to be relevant. And I think online journalism has this, there's a, there's a let's call it corruption. There's a corrupt, corrupting effect in, in having electronic newspapers because they're driven by traffic. And so even the New York Times, which you normally would think is an investigative newspaper, they put up tr uh, uh, stories that flag Donald Trump or Elon Musk always on the front page, always very high uh, above the fold, right, e e electronically. And you have an increase in the use of opinion makers, the Thomas Friedmans of the opinion uh, columns, people who are paid to have opinions. And I tend to find that highly frustrating because they you, you highlighted, thank you for coming to us, because you know, we, we deal at it from many disciplines. But So this complexity of issues, you don't get it, right? You, you get something that boils down to people, and it's people power, even within the New York Times. And to give you an example from my own neck of the woods, and you would know, but uh, here we go. Um, we just had an election campaign in Denmark, and it, uh, the media is obsessive about it. But there's not hardly a single word about the world outside of Denmark. It's as if all of Denmark depends on the Danish welfare system. And, and I just find that astonishing that you have a full media sector running on high, high fuel, high pumping <clears throat> energy, and they don't comment on the fact that there's a war in Europe. Um, and I think that's just a, a lack of standard and a lack of uh, quality 
within journalism itself. And I think these are, this, this trend is structural and I'm quite disillusioned by it. And so, you know, when I have my really bleak moments, I see a world of uh, journalism that by its far majority will become uh, just a, an echo of what Trump is, an appeal to mass engagement. And then there will be small slices of quality, but they will be small and they will be very selective and they will not dominate. Can you correct me on that? Can you get so, my hopes up? The, the only thing I'll say is that when I, when I mean, sort of that might make you a bit less pessimistic, is that when I look back at what was being published 20, 30 years ago, I cannot believe how low the standards were. I mean, if you think that the standards are low now, I mean, look at, look at copies of newspapers from the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. I mean, you would be astonished. The, the standards on fact-checking, on uh, the use of opinion in news reporting, I mean, they were just non-existent. So I, I do think that from that we have come a long way, but I agree with you that one, it is not far enough, and two models that made sense, you know, in the days of printed newspapers, now no longer make sense. I mean, you mentioned people who are paid to, to, to have their opinions published in, in newspapers. I mean, the, the job of a newspaper columnist is not congruent with that of a, of a public intellectual necessarily because the new newspaper columnist is, is paid by the newspaper to provide a different service, entertainment as opposed to education. But the thing is, because now there are so many sources of entertainment and so many sort of um, uh, points of discussion in all kinds of media, not just, not just newspapers, um, the need for that is sort of falling by the wayside. So I, I, I see sort of um, the existence of newspaper columnists as having newspaper columnists as having a bit of an expiry date on them. And this is something that I saw very early on from my mother's own work. She was originally a, a, a reporter and a newspaper columnist. She set up her own website in 2008. Um, within a year of herself setting up her own website without any funding, she wasn't paid for it. It was sort of a hobby. Um, she made her money really from publishing a magazine about food and, and architecture. Um, that website had more traffic than all of Malta's newspapers combined, let alone the one where she was paid a small amount of money to have her opinion column published. And this was in 2008, I mean, let alone now. Um, so I see sort of that ending, you know, people who have something to say have many opportunities to do so. Um, they don't need the offer of publication in the New York Times, although that does give you an important platform. Um, on the sort of corrupting influence built into the economic model of online media, yes, that I agree with you. It is something that we are really having a hard time with um, in the sort of media development world because one of the objectives of the foundation is to foster um, the development of investigative journalism where even when we do the majority of investigative work ourselves, we speak to the sources, we uncover the documents, we do the legal work, even engage in litigation um, to get access to, to information, and we hand it to a media organization on a silver plate. <laughs> There's just no interest um, because it, it, they have other opportunities for generating traffic, let's say. It would be something Donald Trump said or something Elon Musk said or whatever. Um, so this is something that we're struggling with. Um, a lot of it, I think, depends on the way um, we're going back to the supply side again. Um, depends on the way people gain access 
to media or sort of news reporting comes to them, let's say, which is nowadays mostly by social media channels, or let's just say it's heading in that direction. And how is this going to look in the next 10 years or the next 20 years? Is this going to be better or worse than what we have now? Is it going to continue declining? Honestly, I really don't have the answer. I am very worried about it. I'm worried because of that uncertainty. You know, we're coming now a generation of people um, who still goes to the front pages of newspapers, goes to nytimes.com is no longer going to be around by the year 2030, 2040, 2050, whatever. So what, how are the people who come after that, how are the new generations of people born in the 2000s, 2010s, you know, how are they going to consume news, if at all? How is that going to happen? I really don't know. This is something that we are going to have to pioneer. Okay. But I hope we can do it in a way that stops that decline, that I agree with you is happening. We have one more question. Thank you very much for coming here and talking about those issues. Uh, I'm actually from Slovakia, and when Kuciak was uh, killed, I was standing there protesting with other thousands of people, and nothing changed. How do you stay motivated and don't just move to another country which is supposed to be better? <laughs> That's a really good question. I am I mean I my my parents always encouraged me to leave and in fact I left Malta in 2008 and I didn't go back until a year after my mom was murdered. I was in Malta at the time of the murder sort of by accident. Um, by coincidence, because I was helping my mother with her work and I wanted to visit my family. Um, but what got me to go back is that I wanted to make sure, like the rest of my family, that my mother did not give her life in vain, that something came of it, and that change, that, that something would be a change first in the culture of the country, and then a change in the politics of the country. Um, I am sort of, I don't believe in like short term political solutions. Um, I am a bit sort of annoyed that people keep electing the same um, political party that hasn't mended its ways into government like in Slovakia. Um, but at the same time, I am not naive enough to think that a change of political party is going to solve all our problems, that we need cultural change. For that cultural change to happen, we need to show that corruption is a punishable offense, that you are going to go to jail for it. There is a deterrent, it is a crime, and not something you can engage in freely. Um, and that will lead to a generation of people that votes for a different kind of, of political leader. Um, I hope, or is somewhat more critical um, of people who are standing for election, um, or somewhat more objective um, in the way they vote. Um, how do I stay motivated? I don't know, I'm lucky that my mother had a big family. I have two brothers, they're very close in age to me. Um, we have a big support network. I have good friends, Carl is one of them. I'm very lucky to say that. Um, this is really important, I think, having that. And also that Malta is now a member state of the European Union, is a member of the Council of Europe. So I have to understand that I have a certain level of privilege, or that people in my country have a certain level of privilege, that someone from, say, like, let's say, the family of Jamal Khashoggi, who Magnus Kalamar was speaking here about, do not have there is very little chance of actually achieving accountability in a country like Saudi Arabia, or there is very little chance of achieving accountability in a country like Mexico, for example, that is a huge, massive economy um, that can more or less behave the way it pleases. Malta is a small country, member state of the European Union. It is bound to many sort of directives, subject to many regulations. Um, it has no, uh, no natural resources of its own, so it cannot do whatever it pleases. I have to sort of make the most of that privilege. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there might be time for one more question. We have a question on here. Thank you very much for your talk and for your uh, comments. Um, I was wondering, well, I am actually from Mexico. I know the situation there about, like with the journalists, but then how do you, as a person in the general public, like a, one person more in the population, can you support the journalist um, or the, um, this fight for the good information and the right, like the right to be informed in a proper way, but also, well, against corruption? I mean, one of the. I mean, one of the, the the things that I realized very early on. I mean, within days of the murder, um, is that. I mean, so my family had to start speaking out right away because literally the evening of the murder, our prime minister was on CNN. Um, saying that my mother was a, my mother's murder was an aberration and that this doesn't normally happen in Malta that Malta is a normal country and this is a sort of freak incident. Um, uh, the government was circulating misinformation that my mother was investigating oil traffickers um, in Libya and these are the people who really murdered her and so on. So we had to start speaking out to counter. Um, this disinformation immediately. Um, another reason why we spoke out is that looking at the statistics um, of impunity for the murder of journalists, one, you realize that impunity is the norm worldwide. Um, there, is, there is justice in only 4% of cases of murders of journalists. Um, using figures from 2008 up to 2018, if I remember well. And in those cases, there is justice only when um, the, the, the family of the murder journalist or, or you know, close friends of the murder journalist speak out and campaign and, and basically don't give up. Um, so, we know that, you know, unless this happens, it is going to be very difficult to get anywhere. Um, what is sort of a major difference, I believe, between Malta, Slovakia and Mexico? In Mexico, it is simply too dangerous for family members to actually start speaking out. Um, while I did not feel 100% safe in Malta, and while I'm sure that Jan Kusiak's family did not feel 100% safe in Slovakia, they were given a platform by the European Parliament. Um, I mean, there, are, there were awards, there were ceremonies, there were protests. People went out onto the streets, gave a platform to the family, backed them up, you know? There was this kind of sort of social protection. In Mexico, that is not really present. It is simply too dangerous for people to go out there and do that. So in some countries, it simply reaches that point. Um, how do we work backwards from that? We cannot depend on the same sort of strategies that we use here of the family speaking out and so on. It is simply too risky. If a family is brave enough to do that, I mean, I sort of bow down to them. But I understand their reasons for not doing so either. Um, so without some other kind of intervention, um, Mexico is basically stuck. What other kind of intervention is required? The kind of people who are murdering journalists in Mexico are what we call transnational criminals. Yes, they are involved in people trafficking, drugs trafficking, human trafficking, but their customers are all over the world. Um, their intermediaries, the lawyers who set up shell companies for them, open bank accounts, the accountants who manage their affairs, actually deposit the money in bank accounts, do the money laundering, um, buy the yachts for them, all this kind of thing. They are in Switzerland, in France, in the United Kingdom, in Italy. They are in all of these places. So what we need as an intervention is to go after, and this is something I really strongly believe in, those intermediaries and the systems in which they operate. So 
increasingly we have drives for, for example, open company registries that name the owners of those companies that anyone can access. Um, more access for police, for public authorities to information um, on who is depositing money in bank accounts. Better cooperation between authorities internationally. Um, increased collaboration between prosecutors. We need more of this kind of intervention. But I also think we do need to sort of somehow redesign the way the financial system, international financial system operates to make it more difficult to catch out um, these illicit financial flows. And this, I think, is the, the, the intervention that countries like Mexico need. Okay. That will have the knock-on effect, of course, of protecting journalists. I mean, this is one point that I tried to make. Journalists themselves cannot jail criminals. And that if the people who are responsible for, for doing that don't do it, then they are the ones who are going to be, you know, receiving the threats and uh, going to be at the wrong end of a gun. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks everyone for your questions and for attending. I thought it was a great session. Uh, Matthew will be here for a few more minutes afterwards, I think. But for now, you're off the hook, I guess. <laughs> Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you.